anyway, um, tonight I just want to just uh, just encourage us to open our hearts to Jesus and uh, just praise him together. And so, Lord, we just come before you right now. We thank you for the privilege of worshiping you corporately and individually in our hearts, Lord. And I just pray that you would be glorified in this evening. And as Jackie teaches tonight, God, I pray that uh, it would just move us to action, Lord. We, we just need to be a church that is awake and surrendered fully to you. And so we thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. Amen.
the king of my heart be the wind inside my soul the anchor in the waves oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins the echo of my days oh he is my song Skies with his glory will shine. Wonderful day, my 
Jesus is mine. upon you this evening off of ourselves God we just bless your name God we just pray that your Holy Spirit would move in our lives Lord Holy Father burn away my desire for anything out of you, but it's of me, I want more of you, and less of me, holy fire, holy fire, burn away my desire for anything that is not of of me, I want more of you, and less of me, empty me, empty me, and fill what you fill.
Jesus, you are good. And I pray, God, that we would empty ourselves of us and turn our eyes on you and looking full in your wonderful face, Lord. In these days, there's a lot of stuff going on, but God, you are still on the throne. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on you. And would your Holy Spirit, God, purge out of us, Lord, those things that are not of you. And we just ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys be seated. Check, check. Checkity check. Yeah. All right. We're going to finish up tonight. So I invite you to open up. Some of you may say, I thought we did. Nope. I did too. So I got Zephaniah already. And then I discovered. We didn't finish Habakkuk. So we're going to wrap up Habakkuk tonight, and I'll have a jump on Zephaniah next time. So Habakkuk is really very beautiful if you understand how it's all put together. So when we begin, Habakkuk is a lament. It's uh, prophetic poetry. It is. It deals with Habakkuk's questions of God, which we've all had, right? Anybody ever had a question for God? Why are you doing it this way, Lord? What's going on? So that's how it starts. Habakkuk starts off with the questions. What are you doing, God? What's happening? And then the Lord's going to answer him. The two questions that Habakkuk is going to ask, we, we've already talked about, but just by way of remembrance. How long will I cry out and you're not doing anything? Do you ever feel like the circumstance around you, God's not doing anything you see all these things that need handled, and God's not handling it. So Habakkuk is crying out, Lord, where are you at? How come you're not doing anything? Then the Lord answers. He says, oh, I'm doing something, and if I told you what I was doing, you would not believe it. So then he told them, and Habakkuk did not believe it. So then the Lord said to him, look, I'm going to use the Babylonians to judge the wickedness of Judah. So they're going to fall under the judgment of Babylon, but then I'm going to judge Babylon as well. And then Habakkuk asks his second question in his lamentation, and that is, Babylon's worse than us. How can you use Babylon? How can you use somebody who's worse than us to bring judgment upon Judah? And the Lord lays out for Habakkuk that, one, your, your, your premise is wrong. The idea that they are worse than you is probably inaccurate. In fact, through the other prophets, God had already declared that Judah and Israel were like Sodom and Gomorrah. In fact, when he's declaring it, talking about it in the book of Ezekiel, you can read about it in Ezekiel chapter 16, he calls Judah the sister of Sodom and Gomorrah. So the concept is you're not better than them. You don't have less sin just because you have uh, the, the ability to lay claim to the title of being God's elect, right? That God chose the nation of Israel. But you still have a sin problem. One, your premise is wrong. Two, God says, not only am I going to judge you, I'm going to judge all the world. There, all the world will stand. And then he lays out before Habakkuk the five woes. That was chapter 2. Chapter 2, he goes through the five woes. And as he lays out the five woes, he says, the concept, right? There's going to be a reckoning for these things. One, the woe of the extortioner, uh, taking advantage of other people, 
so that you can get rich. Well, that doesn't happen anymore. It only happened back then, right? So woe to the extortioner. Woe to him who builds himself a strong ivory tower and thinks he is secure. That was the second woe. Anybody ever assume that they've built a, a big enough fortress against any possible judgment from the Lord that, that, that the Lord couldn't bring his judgment? The third one is woe to the civilized demoralized. You, you call yourself civilized, but you are the least moral of all people. Would we say less than that today? Well, if we looked at the, the, the global state of morality, it's not just us, the global state of morality, two particular things in that woe, violence breeds violence, and a tolerated sin will ultimately destroy. It'll destroy a nation and it will destroy a person. Tolerated sin brings destruction. The fourth woe, woe to the shameless. Woe to those who are able to sin and not even recognize it as sin anymore. They have no shame. And the last woe is woe to the idolatrous. So he's laying out the concept in the five woes. He's talking about Babylon specifically. So Babylon, whom I'm going to use to judge Judah, they're guilty of these five woes. But in the concept behind it is all nations are on a trajectory to become Babylon. Have you ever read the book of Revelation? You ever notice that there is a name of a city that's brought up in the book of Revelation? Two cities, a tale of two cities. One city, Jerusalem, the city of God, perhaps, and the other, the city of Babylon. You been to Babylon recently? There's nothing there. There's some rubble. Babylon is symbolic for that city that is in rebellion against God. And so you see this idea in the five woes, the guilt laid out over the world, over the nations, over Judah and the rest of the world. And that leads us to the last part of Habakkuk, which is his prayer. And it is, it's really a song. Remember, I told you all of this is a lament. So it's like a, a funeral dirge. But he says in verse 1 of Habakkuk 3, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet according to Shigianoth. Shigianoth is a style. It is an ecstatic shrieking. So if I did it, I would have scared you all. Right? Because you wouldn't expect me to make this loud Noise. That's the way. So you need to understand. And this lament is if if Habakkuk was delivering this, it would have been shocking to the people. And the point of it is to express his own shock in the guilt of the nations and the power of God. And so he's going to really focus in on his understanding now, by the time he gets to chapter three and his interaction with God, that God is able to deal with the problems. And now he's afraid of how that's going to happen. He's afraid of, of the day of the Lord. And so he's going to discuss that. But he also has reliance on God. He trusts God. Because if you remember, back in the beginning, the Lord said, this is how you should be living, Habakkuk. He said, instead of looking at all the things around you and what's wrong with all those things, you're, you are living your life by sight. He said, the just shall live by faith. They will trust me, right? We go back to 1 Peter chapter 2, where we see that Jesus is able to endure the things that he suffered because he entrusted himself into the hands of his father. So he is walking in faith with his Father, that God's purpose and plan is totally going to be worked out. It's a example for you and I that that's how we are to live our life. If you looked at Jesus' life and he's being arrested and he's being beaten and all the things are going on, you would think that it's that there's just a total destruction of anything good is happening. But what we realize is through that, the greatest story ever told the, the gospel is being lived out right and the ability for salvation to come is being wrought through what he's doing the just shall live by faith not by sight 
So, so Habakkuk's expressing this in this song, a loud, ecstatic utterance. So he says, verse 2, O Lord, I have heard the report of you and your work. O Lord, do I fear. So he's, he's heard the things that God says he's going to do and the, and the level of guilt before the people, and he's afraid. Now, it's told, in, it's told to us in Proverbs 1, 7 that the fear of the Lord is what? As the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of wisdom. To recognize God's in charge, that God is just, that God is good, that God has wrath, that there will be a reckoning, that, that reverence, that fear, and it is fear. I, I, don't, I don't mean to say it in a way like, trust me, when you stand before God Almighty, I think if we could describe the emotions we would feel in that moment, fear is going to be one of those. Right before the holy God. The reason that our fear will be quelled is because of the blood of Jesus Christ and his robe of righteousness draped around us at the same time. Amen? So he's filled with fear, but his confidence is on the Lord. He says, in the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known in wrath, remember mercy. So his idea is, Lord, I know this is coming and I know the judgment is going to be poured out. So, Lord, please, you know, revive the work again. Don't don't give up hope on the nation uh, that there would be a revival of Israel, which there is. There's going to be a remnant that returns, right? The remnant is going to come back into the land. Remember mercy. Do not make a full end of us. And the idea of this wrath, he's going to portray in the rest of the chapter as a storm. In fact, there was a president who was reading through Habakkuk chapter 3. This is the story anyway. And he got to the description of the storm that comes from the south in the desert. And he decided to call the, uh, the attack that he was going to put forward desert storm. So you look here, and this is what he's describing. This is a picture of God's judgment and wrath illustrated by a desert storm coming uh, across the land. So look how he begins it in verse 3. It says, God came from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. So he's coming from the south, coming up through the desert. He, this is a portrayal of the desert storm. His splendor covered the heavens, and the earth is full of his praise. His brightness like the light, and rays flashed from his hand, and there he veiled his power. Now, I just want you to think about what a, a brewing storm looks like. You see the lightning, and you can see it in the distance, but all that power is veiled by the dark clouds of the storm. You kind of get the picture of this this is, the, this is the way, the illustration that Habakkuk is giving of this judgment of God that is coming. The beginning of the storm, <coughs> the presence of that storm, overwhelming. The sound is like the earth is full of praise because if you've ever been in the midst of a wild and crazy storm, it's loud. It's amazing how much noise can be produced in, uh, in the midst of a hurricane. So he's describing this as the power of God on display, storm clouds on the horizon, his brightness, the lightning covered, veiled by the cloud. Look at verse five. Before him went pestilence and plague followed on his heel. So keep, get the picture. As the storm is coming, it's pushing in front of it all the, all this, the Bible describes it as pestilence, all the All the little critters, all the bugs, all the stuff, it's all getting blown out in front. And then after the storm passes through, what comes on its wake? We have all that uh, stilled water. You have opportunity for plagues. It also brings up a picture, right, of the plagues in Egypt and the things that were going on in the past, reminders of that. And then he describes again, he stood and measured the earth. And he looked and he shook the nations. And I want you to recognize that this storm he's describing, he's describing not just in the concept of judgment upon Judah, but he's describing the day of the Lord, judgment on the earth. 
And we'll see those pictures a little bit more. There is, in reality, the pattern that we see replaced, uh, uh, that we see um, replayed over and over again that shows us little judgments, little days of the Lord, if you will, that become a pattern for the great day of the Lord that we read about at the end of the book of Revelation. And so he's describing this. He says, he, he, look, he shook all the nations. This is global. Then the eternal mountains were scattered. You know, he's saying, like, look at the mountains. They've been here forever. But the storm's so big, the mountains are being blown down. The mountains are being moved. The everlasting hills, they sink low because his were the everlasting ways. So he's describing the immense and incredible power of God in this storm. Verse 7, I saw the tents of Cushan in affliction and the curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. And the idea of seeing the tents out in the desert as the storm comes. Well, what good's a tent going to do against all the winds of this of the hurricane coming through. Our civilizations, our ability to build all of this, all of this stuff cannot stand before a holy God who has come for a day of reckoning. Nothing's going to stand. It'd be like tents in the wind, like the tents of Kushan or the tents of Midian. They're going to crumble and they will tremble. Now, as you think about this, in the, in the desert, especially in, in Judah, it's a very harsh desert. And over the summer, the sun bakes the desert hard. So the desert there is a hard, desolate place. It's not like you would picture where you walk across like tall sand dunes. It's, it is a hard, packed place. And every year in Israel... When the spring comes through and the early rains begin, that rain comes suddenly and it hits all that hard ground and it doesn't soak in. And it creates what we know in the desert as flash floods. And the flash floods come through and they're all coming down toward the Dead Sea, right? That's the lowest place there. And so as they come down through the mountains, you have these streams or rivers that look like mud, and the Dead Sea is crystal bluish. It's really trippy. If you get a chance to, to, to come with us, down, we're going to stay a night at the Dead Sea. So you'll get a chance to really spend some time there and check it out. But when that flood war, one year when we were there, this happened. And all the flood waters come in and it <clears throat> dilutes a little bit the salt water content in the areas where the flash flood is coming in and it turns all that blue water brownish because it's got all that mud that has come down into the water. And so he just, he's describing this and he's describing the, the point of it. Is the point of this because you're angry at the river? Look what it says, verse eight. Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers or your indignation against the sea? when you rode on your horses on your chariot of salvation. So you have this picture that we saw in Ezekiel of God on his throne chariot, which is a, an illustration of the true God of the storms. You see the God of the storms in that area that the nation of Judah wanted to worship often is a God you've heard the name of. Baal was the Lord of the storms. So oftentimes you have uh, what you call technically a polemic, which is a illustration or a, uh, a message delivered by a prophet against what the people were trusting in and other idolatry. So instead of depicting Baal as a storm God, they would pick Yahweh. He is the storm. He's bigger. He's riding his storm chariot. And they would describe that before the people. And his, his point is, as you're coming down, as this judgment is being laid out, it's not about the sea. It's not about the rivers. It's about judgment on the wicked. When we go back to Genesis chapter three and four, and we see the fall of man and the first murder, right? Two brothers, 
Cain and Abel. Do you remember what the Lord said to Cain when he came and asked him, where's your brother? Where's your brother? And Cain says, am I my brother's keeper? And then the Lord says, well, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. So the injustice of one murder God was aware of and can you imagine how that's multiplied over the earth in the last 10,000 years? Some would argue we have 10,000 years of written history. Well, if that's true, how, how much murder has there been? And you think about all of that and you think, you begin to understand what the Bible calls the long suffering of God, the patience of God as he withholds judgment. But you can also understand the wrath that will come one day, right? The big storm that, that the Lord is going to pour out. And then he makes a description of uh, the terror of the warrior. We see it, it begin in verse nine. He says, you strip the sheath from your bow calling for many arrows. Now, <laughs> this is one of those areas <clears throat> where I encourage people to use multiple translations because if you do, you'll discover that they all say something different there. It's all, all say something a little bit different. And why do they all say something different? It indicates that in the language, it's a difficult thing to translate. The idea is, it's not, it's not simple to, to get across the idea that's being laid out. Oh, really, what is being said is your bow is naked and sworn in all the arrow shafts with a word. So the idea is you've got your bows ready to go and your arrows aren't going to miss. Like you've, you've put the, the magic on the arrows and now they are going to always hit their target. They're never going to miss. And so your arrows are going to fly. They are going to strike home. You split the earth with rivers. And so again, you have the picture of the storm being led by, the, by this Lord over the storm who has his bow unsheathed and he's letting fly his arrows and they all hit where he wants them to hit. What's that sound like he's describing? So if you, if you can understand the, the, the metaphor of the storm, it's, it's like he's shooting forth lightning from his bow, but it's not just random lightning. It's lightning intended to hit all the targets he's calling for them. And the, and the rivers of flood that are coming down uh, all surrounded this incredible display of, of power. And all of this Habakkuk is describing. He says in verse 10, the mountains saw you and writhed. So all of creation is trembling, right? Because the maker is pouring out his wrath. So the mountains saw you, they writhed. The raging water swept on. So they're sweeping on. The mountains are writhing. Picture it as, as a floodwaters come down in the valleys between mountains and erodes the dirt and it pulls down the dirt from the side. You have this torrential flood being laid out and the deep gave forth its voice it lifted its hands on high the sun and the moon stood still in their place at the as the light of your arrows as they sped by at the flash of your glittering spear so just describing this incredible act of power look no matter what crazy storm you and i have ever seen it is tiny in comparison to the power of the eternal God, right? But Habakkuk is relating to the people through his experience, what they see as this incredible, mighty event taking place. And he's relating that event to the power of God and the fact that God's judgment is coming. He says in verse 12, you march through the earth in fury, you threshed the nations in anger. This goes back. We'll see this in Zechariah when we get to Zechariah. We've seen it in a, 
and a few other of the prophets where it talks about the coming of the day of the Lord and that the Lord, he doesn't need any help. He takes care of it himself. That he's going to pass through the nations, right? He's going to trample the grapes of wrath. Because we don't have a job in that battle. Our job in that battle is just to be there. The Lord, he's not going to need our help. He's not, we don't have, we're not going to be doing any fighting. We're going to be sitting there with our eyes wide open and our mouths open and, and ultimately uh, praising his name. You march through the earth in fury. You thresh the nations. What was the point of threshing? To divide what? You divide the chaff, the chaff from the kernel, Right? So the idea that we see in the harvest of the earth that we see, that we read about in the book of Revelation, we see being laid out here. And the important thing to recognize, this is bigger than just Babylon coming to Judah. Babylon is going to come to Judah. They are going to be conquered. They're going to be conquered more than once. I, I would argue four times, but there's three definite times. And the last time they're totally destroyed. And as this, as this happens, as this goes forth, we see upon that a pattern that we read about in the book of Revelation, a pattern of another day of the Lord. You can read about it in Revelation 19, but it sounds very similar, big, uh, a big event to the judgment of the earth. In verse 13, he says, you went out for the salvation of your people. For the salvation of your anointed, you crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. Selah. Now he talks about the triumph of Messiah. What was the, what is the proto-evangelicum? The proto-evangelicum is a Latin term talking about the first mention of the gospel. It's Genesis 3.16 when, when the Lord says that the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the serpent. Right, And so you have the first promise of a, a deliverer that would deliver the people from their sin. And so here you see this, you went out for the salvation of the people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked. Is there a day where God once and for all separates the righteous and the wicked? Is there a once a finished day of judgment? Yeah, and every little picture of judgment that God brought upon a nation, on, even on the nation of Israel and on other nations, is a picture of the reality that there will be a day coming for all. The Bible uses the phrase, all the nations, multiple times. So there's going to be this, this outpouring. Look at verse 14. You pierced uh, with his own arrows, the heads of his warriors who came like a whirlwind to scatter me, rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. You trampled the sea with your horses in the surging of the mighty waters. And as you look at this, there's, there's a lot of pictures, but throughout Old Testament scripture, you have the idea of the sea being the place from which the chaos monster comes. When you read the book of, of Revelation, where does the beast come out of? Comes out of the sea. Comes out of the sea. The nation of Israel was not a, a seafaring people. They didn't have great navies. Uh, the sea was something they didn't really like. So when you read the book of Revelation, you come to chapter 21 and 22, and it describes a new heaven and a new earth, and it says there's no sea there. Some people go, oh, I'm really going to miss the beach. But I don't know that that's what he's talking about. He's talking about the place where the boogeyman lives. You and I would say there's no under the bed there. There's no monster in the closet. You get the idea? That it's, it, is, it is the idea that we have in our minds of where, the, where does evil spring up out of, right? When we're children, you remember when you go to bed? And you got to turn out the light, but it's a long ways to the bed. So you would always get that deal where you get up, pick up some speed, flick out the light, catch the air, right? And land on the bed and pull them covers over quick. 
Why do we do that? Because we have this like little innate fear that there's something scary under the bed, right? Or something in the dark. And so for them, that's the idea. And so when he says you're trampling the sea and you're, you're, the idea is when God comes to, in his final judgment to judge the wicked and the righteous and to destroy uh, the wicked once and for all, from whence we'll move toward a new heaven and a new earth, there's not going to be any more boogeyman. There's no more, there's no more of those things that we fear because God is ultimately going to deliver through it all. And then it's, it's, it's pretty cool because, yeah, I got time. It's pretty cool. You trampled the sea with your horses and the surging of mighty waters. Now, if you think about that, and then you kind of put up the parallel, Revelation 19. He says, then I saw an angel standing in the sun, Revelation 19, verse 17. Uh, and with a loud voice, he called to all the birds that fly overhead, come gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, their riders, and all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the king. Now, I know we look at it and we, we're talking about an antichrist and all those things. I just want to step back from that and I want you to see the a little bit of the mystery behind it, a little bit of the picture behind it, okay? I'm not saying those things aren't happening. Don't misunderstand me. But if you take a step back and you spent time in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, you know that in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, there is a great dragon that God kills and he uses the meat of the dragon to feed the nations, and the dragon is a picture of like we're talking about of representing evil or the wicked in the world. And that the wicked in the world is being destroyed and that the people, the righteous, those who are, whose trust or whose faith is in God, they are brought through and there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Okay, so in Revelation you see the same thing, only it's described as this huge battle, right? And you have the Antichrist and the armies of the world in opposition against God gathered for one great battle. In Ezekiel 38, it's called Gog and Magog. In Revelation chapter 20, what's it called? It's Gog and Magog again. So the pictures that are being laid out are these pictures of God's ultimate deliverance of from the wicked into the new heaven, the new earth, the new creation, that God is able to accomplish these things. And so here in Habakkuk, he's giving us this illustration in a storm. In Revelation, he's showing it to us in a war. In the same way in Ezekiel, he's showing it to us in a war. In, a war. in Isaiah, as the destruction of a dragon, or Jeremiah, as the destruction of Leviathan. So you have these pictures they're, they're, that doesn't mean it's not, it's not real. They're describing God's ultimate deliverance from evil. Now, do you believe, no matter how crazy life gets on this world, that God is and will ultimately deliver you from whatever's going on to his presence? Then the just don't say the words of Habakkuk. Where are you, Lord? What's happening because the just shall live by faith. God is my deliverer. Well, what about all this crazy stuff in the world? God is my deliverer. What about if the, you know, Joe Biden runs for re-election and gets it? God is my deliverer. <laughs> Look, just so you know, this world's crazy enough, I'll believe anything now. So, we look at all those things. I just want you to hear the message of hope. You have the picture of judgment, but behind that judgment, you have this message of hope that ultimately it's the destruction once and for all of evil, right? Which everybody would say, we may all disagree on what evil is, but we would all say we want to see the destruction of evil, right? And the perseverance of good. And so here, you, this is the story 
This is the story that Habakkuk is laying out. Now, don't miss this because the end of Habakkuk is amazing. In verse 16, he says, I hear and my body trembles and my lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness has entered into my bones and my legs tremble beneath me. So he don't like any of the stuff that's about to come, right? I mean, there's not another way for him to say, oh, I'm really excited about this whole Babylonian invasion and the loss of everything. I'm super stoked. No, he says, man, I'm scared and I'm not at all excited and I'm filled with trepidation, yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon the people who invade us. Because even though Judah is under judgment, he also knows all evil is under judgment. Not just this evil or that evil, all evil is going to come under judgment. So he's making a decision in the concept, as he's thought about the concept of God's judgment and his deliverance, he's making a decision that says, so I'm just going to not live by what I see all around me and all the things that I think where people are getting away with it or why would you let Babylon do that? And I'm just going to wait for God to bring his justice because he will. The day of his justice will come. Now look, he's going to lay out six things that are going to go bad. You ready? Though the fig tree should not blossom, that's one, nor fruit, beyond the vines two the produce of the olive fail as three uh, and the fields yield no food as four the flocks be cut off from the fold that's five and there's no herd in the stalls so basically i'm losing everything there's nothing there's no food even the trees that grow wild don't have any fruit on them there's, even, though, even though there's nothing, even though if I was to look around me, there is nothing anywhere. It's as bad as it could ever be. The worst possible thing I could see, even though that's what I see, he says, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. So here's the key. There's, there's a couple of keys you want to get. In order for the Lord to be your strength, you have to make that choice that says, I'm going to live by faith and not by sight. For the just shall live by faith, right? The ones who are justified, they trust the Lord. But here you also have a definition of joy, and I don't want you to miss this. And the definition of joy is the resolute assurance that God has not lost interest in your problems or that he is powerless to deal with them. That's what robs us of our joy. That God doesn't care. He doesn't see me. Remember where Habakkuk started? Lord, how long will I cry out? You're not doing anything. What's going on? Right? And when Habakkuk ends, he has his joy again. Why? Not because he's got all of his stuff and everything's good. He says, even though I don't have anything, I have the resolute assurance that God still sees me and that God is powerful enough to move on my behalf. So it's always too soon to give up hope. So we put our trust in him. We set our eyes on him and the Lord God will carry us through. Look at verse 19. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me to tread on the high places. Now, if you haven't been to Israel, this was not going to make much sense to you. Where you're thinking mule deer right now. So that's probably the wrong picture. It's not white-tailed deer either. But there are these, I would say they're more like goats than deer. But you go to Israel and you go to En Gedi. It's called the goat. That's what En Gedi means. And you'll be walking through all these giant trees. And you're walking through this valley where David hid from Saul. You guys know the story? And he crawled in the cave, right? You guys, you guys know he lived in the caves up there. And as you're walking past these trees, 
with birds in them, little chip monkey things, rock chucks. I call them all rock chucks, but they're apparently they're something else. But uh, at the very top of the tree, you'll see this goat, an ibex. You guys ever seen an ibex? So they've got these, the, the shofar, the horns that they blow, that's uh, the, the ibex horn, and it's on the top of the tree. No, no, not sticking its head up. It climbed up on the top of the tree. It's sticking out the top. It's the weirdest thing you'll ever see because you walk up to the tree and you look and you're used to seeing birds and all the other things in the tree, but not used to seeing this big old giant goat on the top. And it is wild. And then you are walking up and there's cliffs on both sides in Engedi. And as you're walking up the trail, which is a little bit treacherous, but there's a big waterfall at the end. So it's awesome to make it all the way to the waterfall. And as you're walking up and you got these cliffs on both sides, those Ibex are just trucking. They're way faster than you and I on the edge of the cliff where there's like, you know, no place to stand. Now, what's the point of the story? The point of the story is, is that Habakkuk is recognizing, you know, the Lord will make me able to stand in whatever circumstance I'm in. He'll give me the feet. He'll give me what I need to be able to stand in the places where he sends me. So that's the place where David lived in the caves for all those years. That's the place where David wrote a lot of the first 70 Psalms in the book of Psalms. So you, you see this beautiful thing. And at the end, he says, to the choir master on stringed instruments. So this whole book we've gone through, the three chapters of Habakkuk, was sung. Remember, it's a, it's a lament, a funeral dirge. And when you get to chapter three, that's where the heavy metal guys come out and they start screaming. That's how it is, right? Because he said, this is where the ecstatic, loud utterance comes through as it builds its crescendo to the realization that God is in control. Amen? Amen. Why don't you guys stand with me? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for an opportunity to study this book and to understand maybe a little bit more about your character, who you are, how you're moving, what you're doing in our life, God. We can trust you. We put our hope in you. We know that you are able. So God, as we think about this, help us recognize when we have lost our joy, when we're seeing the things around us and we're afraid of all those things and we've lost our fear of the Lord. We've lost the reality that God is in control. And that judgment may not be around the corner, but there is a day of salvation and there is a day of judgment. And you, Lord God Almighty, are able to deliver us. So may we put our hope and our trust in you, in Jesus' name. Amen.
God, we just ask as we go from this place, Lord, that you'd equip us to be your hands and feet, that we would have an answer for him who asks a reason for the hope that is within us. And God, may you be glorified as we shine your light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week. Oh. Yeah, we're taking all the chairs down, so if you want to help, thanks. If you don't want to help, thanks anyway. <laughs>